Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody, welcome back to This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG. TWIG is a weekly live global health news roundup. We've got a live audience and if you're watching this live, feel free to interact with us and send us your questions, thoughts, comments, etc. over Twitter using the hashtag TWIG, T-W-I-G-H. Uh, this week, we're talking about conflicts in health. Conflicts in health is a really broad subject, so we're not going to cover the whole thing in one episode. But in this particular episode, we're going to focus in on the impact that conflict has on the ability of the healthcare system to provide care to the people. So we're really talking about healthcare being in danger. And we've got a really exciting guest speaker with us today from the ICRC. Um, I'm going to ask Chris. Chris, would you do a little introduction of Bruce? Uh, we're excited to have Bruce on the show with us tonight. Absolutely. So today we're covering healthcare in times of conflict and emergency, and we're featuring an organization through the ICRC, Healthcare in Danger. Now, in conflicts like those occurring in Sudan, Syria, Iraq, Ukraine, and beyond, war generally or completely complicates the efforts of those not involved in the war to get the healthcare that they need. Um, in order to really give you the full information that we'd like you to have on this topic, we've brought in Dr. Bruce Ashaya Chauvin. He is a physician with broad experience and expertise in international public health and humanitarian action. Um, he has a very extensive and wonderful career in this sector. He's former head of health division of the International Community of the Red Cross, uh, as well as the head of the health department of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. He currently serves as the medical advisor of healthcare uh, or I'm sorry, for the Healthcare in Danger project and has since November 2012. And he has spent many careers in the field with the ICRC, everywhere from Phnom Penh to Beirut and Geneva. Hello, Dr. Bruce. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you very much for inviting me. We really appreciate this opportunity. Well, we're excited to have someone of, with your experience, your background, your insight on the show, and I think everybody watching the show is going to be excited to learn uh, more about the subject matter. I'm going to start off, and I'm going to ask uh, Terry. Terry, would you just jump in and quickly give us a, in a nutshell, what are the areas of healthcare that really get affected uh, in a conflict situation? So, Greg, um, everything's affected during conflict situations when we're dealing with health. And what gets interrupted is there's four major areas. One is that there's attacks against patients, then attacks against physicians and providers, against facilities. There's killings, there's kidnappings, there's roadblocks to get to services. There's interruption of the services. All of this occurs when it's really needed. And that's why it gets so frustrating and why we need the leadership like is being demonstrated in this call of dealing with Healthcare in trouble, healthcare in danger. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the, the, the point of this discussion is that when we think about conflict, uh, we should move beyond just thinking about the, the fact that actual soldiers and people that are directly involved with the conflict are affected. Civil society is affected. Regular people die, and uh, and that's extremely important. Now, healthcare in danger. This is something. This is an initiative that's being led by the ICRC, which is the International Committee of the Red Cross. I'm going to ask Bruce. Bruce, could you tell us a little bit about healthcare in danger and, and, and what it's about? Yes, of course. Uh, healthcare in danger is um, was felt as a campaign at the beginning, became a project, and uh, between you and us, I think it has to be said that what we want to get is that healthcare in danger becomes an issue, because it's not only the question for the ICRC or for the Red Cross or Red Crescent National Societies. This is a question that affects all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. That sounds fantastic. I think Katie's got a question she wants to jump in there with. Katie, over to you. Yeah. No, and you mentioned it when you, you spoke there. You said that the violence against healthcare is probably one of the biggest humanitarian issues and we need to have focus on it. So uh, can you explain a little bit more about uh, how that is? Yes. I think... Um, um, Wars have never been good for health and this for many, many years. And this basically is the creation of the, the Red Cross and uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, what maybe is different with this project and what has to be understood is that instead of looking at the problems in isolation, something happening there with an ambulance, something there affecting healthcare providers or patients or facilities, this project gives the possibility to look at the problem 
from an holistic perspective and and this is what makes it different it's all the problems in one basket yeah. and that's incredibly important because when you look at what's going on currently in the number of conflicts that we have it seems that healthcare in danger is really here to consolidate all of that information and all of those events so that people can get involved and so that organizations can truly be effective um, I mean, I recently read something that said that in the four years since the start of the Syrian war, um, that healthcare workers are among the conflict's major targets, with at least 610 medical personnel being killed during deliberate attacks on hospitals and medical facilities. And so there's this huge toll that's being taken on the people who deliver care. You know, and it's almost exponential. If one healthcare worker gets hurt, that goes forward, you know, to restrict access to a multitude of people, be they internally displaced people. Um, refugees from other countries that have fled into into those countries. I mean, it, it really does have this massive knock-on effect when when somebody within the healthcare sector becomes disabled or unable to to effectively do their job. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you 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 said it all, but uh, maybe just a, a, a small anecdote for um, to help to understand. As you said, I was based in Beirut before taking over this position, met several doctors coming from Damascus at the time who told me that uh, in, in case they drive their car, it is more dangerous for them to be arrested with a dressing kit in their car compared to a Kalashnikov because if they have a Kalashnikov, everybody will understand this is made to help them to protect themselves if they have a dressing kit they might treat someone from the opposition so as well described by many organizations today um, the consequences of the conflict in uh, the healthcare community in Syria is huge and um, it is not only what is visible it is also what is less visible the number of wounded the number of uh, uh, children that haven't got uh, immunization campaigns and the number of women that can't address uh, the facilities when needed for the de delivery for instance yeah right, absolutely it must be really difficult uh, and, and I imagine there are efforts to do this but it must be really difficult to quantify uh, the, the, the the cost in terms of human lives when there's a, when there's a conflict you know over and above the people that you know the immediate people that die from violence but the people that die or get ill or there's the morbidity and mor mortality associated with uh, vaccine programs for example that fall apart so so let's just jump in um, and and so this is obviously a really really important issue and you've addressed like what the problems are and how big of an issue it is so what is healthcare in danger doing on the ground to attempt to address and resolve these issues so there are actions that can be uh, achieved at the ground level and this is uh, as I said from the beginning something that ICRC does for many many years but the fact that we've pulled this into one basket means also that we are working with a lot of different organizations to try to find solutions that are tailored for the context um, some of the solutions uh, are related if if let's look at hospitals for instance in hospitals you know most of the time we we look at what we can do inside hospital a lot of the professionals that have worked with us explain how important it is to look at the perimeter around the hospital and adjust this perimeter to protect um, healthcare providers at in the emergency department from you know the sudden entry of armed groups or angry relatives or anything that can disturb their work mm -hmm. now and I you had mentioned briefly in your last statement that you know the ICRC you had spoken to somebody who had said that it was more dangerous to be caught with a roll of gauze than it was with a Kalashnikov but the ICRC is known for for helping whoever needs help, you know, sort of non-discriminately. So do people just not understand that you're there to help everybody? They think that you're only there to help the opposition or their enemies? I mean, why do you think that that's a, a point of contention? Well, first of all, uh, this example was not about an ICRC doctor. It was oh. about a Syrian doctor. But um, the, the, the fact is there, and how can we help 
these people to uh, to act and to act in an impartial way. Impartiality is as important as neutrality when we try to look at the sake of the patients. So if you want to do something for this, uh, you can't only support one doctor. You need also to negotiate with governments. You need to get other organizations to help you to get into the same direction. The message from healthcare in danger is very, very clear. ICRC alone, as big as we are, MSF alone, anyone alone won't be able to solve this problem. We have to work all together. Right, wow. it's exciting stuff. Um, and I'm excited to see the work that the ICRC or the International Committee of the Red Cross are doing in this area. Uh, as has been said during the show tonight, they've got a long history of doing fantastic work uh, in, 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 con in conflict areas. So like a big you know, thumbs up to the ICRC. We, we really uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. On the, the subject matter of conflict and health, uh, Jessica, our science guru, I believe has an interesting article in our science update that she wants to share. Uh, Jessica, over to you. Right. Well, um, you know, we've been talking about conflict and violence against the healthcare providers and healthcare system or anyone involved um, in providing healthcare. And I tried, really tried to find a good article that addressed this, but I couldn't find anything recent. And I do like to keep it update, you know, as recent as possible on. Um, particularly in, in conflict or armed situations. But I did find an interesting study that was published in PLOS One this month that uh, reported how violence against physicians by patients was very prevalent in China. Now, the researchers surveyed 123 hospitals in three provinces, and that's over 112, sorry, uh, over 1,200 questionnaires. And then they found that the rates of exposure to verbal abuse was over 90%, and threats of an actual physical was uh, assault of uh, clinicians were over 80 percent. And they also found that the more frequent the exposure to these, these factors, the more that it affected the emotional well-being, job satisfaction, and the intention to leave of the healthcare providers. Um, and so basically what this, this study found was that violence against physicians in China uh, by patients is really common, and the more frequent it is, the more it impacts their emotional well-being and other outcomes related to job satisfaction. And this is in particular verbal abuse. Um, they found that, that there was even a, more of a higher impact with verbal abuse, the more frequent it is, than even just some of the physical assault, even though physical assault did happen pretty commonly. Well, I, I can tell you, I worked in South Africa. I was uh, more than one, I worked in psychiatry for a while, and I was uh, once locked in a room with a patient by the patient who had the key to the room. I was locked in there with him. He had the key. He was properly psychotic and was threatening oh, to God. kill me. Um, luckily wow. he didn't, so I'm here today. And I had a, another little anecdote. I was once, when I was working in surgery, I had a, a patient pull a gun out and threaten me. Well, it was actually the friend of a patient who pulled the gun out uh, and insisted that I, um, that I save his friend, uh, which of course, uh, under those circumstances, you do your very best. Um, so those are a little, just off the back of what you've said, Jessica, those are my personal experiences there. We're going to ask Katie to do her regular Katie's Career Corner. But actually, before we do, uh, Bruce, on the careers front, I've got a quick question I want to run past you. Um, if a young person was interested in working in the area of conflict and health, do you have any recommendations or suggestions in terms of what they should study or what kind of experience they should get or what sorts of skill sets they should be trying to piece together in order to be able to add value in the area that, that you currently work? Yes, for sure. Uh, I think uh, if they want to do that, uh, the first thing they have to do is to go on the Healthcare and Danger platform. Uh, they will find all the resources coming out of this incredible um, you know, number of experts that join the ICRC um, and many other organizations to find solutions. Don't forget that we are not looking for a new set of laws. We have all the laws we need. We need to sit together and to find ways how can we improve the implementation of the existing law. And with the examples you have provided just before, this um, gives maybe two important informations. The first one is the importance of the data collection, but also the limit of the data we collect. We, on one hand, you, you need evidence, and uh, it's our all responsibility, really, to, to build this evidence, as well as implementing solutions 
all together. The example of China is interesting because China is not at war but has a lot of problems that are a bit like if it happens in wars. So the recommendations coming out of the project are applicable also in many other situations. Very interesting. Okay, thanks Bruce. That, that was actually fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, now, Katie's got some career opportunities that she wants to talk about and I think, Katie, tell me if I'm wrong, but that they relate to this area of conflict and health. Am I right Does or they, am I wrong? Don't they always? Yes. They always do. Okay, thanks very much, Katie. Over to you. Yes, so this week on Katie's Career Corner, I'm going to name a few because I have three, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I just wanted to highlight the different areas you can work within in this sector. Um, so obviously, thinking about what's going on in the world right now, uh, there's a position in Nepal uh, through Solidarité Internationale, and it's a distribution program manager or logistician. So a lot of times I like to highlight um, perhaps not the directly health-related positions. So distribution, getting you know materials to where they need to go and planning all that takes a lot of work. Um, second job is through the ICRC. It's a nutritionist. Um, so again, thinking along the lines that health and uh, disaster preparedness and everything, they're all inter, uh, inter combined, intertwined, intertwined. Intercombined, uh, that's a new word. <laughs> I make up <laughs> words too. Of inventing words on the show. I'm gonna write Intercombined words. <laughs> Intercombined words. <laughs> Anyways, the third one that I have for you guys, if I'm able to speak today, is a capacity development program officer in Syria and Turkey from the organization People in Need. So again, thinking along the lines of training and building capacities in these situations. Oh. And Thanks that's very much, Katie. That's fantastic. Uh, and we will intercombine all of that information into our, <laughs> into our heads. I'm going to ask, uh, Chris, can you just tell us a little bit about how people can get involved with this healthcare in danger uh, if, they're, if they're watching this and they're interested to know more. Absolutely. Um, as Dr. Bruce mentioned, the Healthcare in Danger website is a fantastic resource for any of the things you might be interested in. Um, I've put together sort of the way you can find them on Twitter. They're at HCID Project, and you can communicate with them or tag them in your tweets with hashtag HCID or hashtag Protect Healthcare. Um, I also spent, um, I was going to say a couple of minutes, but a couple of hours getting lost on their website because they have a number of e-courses available to anyone, again, with an interest or curiosity in this area of global health and global wellness and development. Um, they have at least 10 different modules that cover everything from victims to the law behind the healthcare in conflict, communications, data, and media coverage. So it's really uh, a very vast and diverse place to go for information. Uh, we also have a number of contacts, people you can get in touch with directly if you have questions about the communication campaign, data, community management, partnerships, all of that. And this information will be available on our website in the next few days. So be sure to check that out um, because it really is going to be, if, if you're a giant healthcare nerd like me, you will get lost for hours as well. Okay, well, thanks very much, Chris. Thanks very much to the entire panel. It's been great having you guys here. I've really, I've learned a lot. This is an, ex an exciting thing. Just a little bit about Twig. If you're, uh, if this is your first time here, we've got a website, www.twig.org, T-W-I-G-H, This Week in Global Health. We've got an email address, hello at twig.org. You can get in touch with us. Or on the Twitterverse, uh, we've got at Twig Team. We've got the hashtag Twig. You can get in touch. We've got a Facebook page, YouTube channel which you're probably watching this on. We're on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, we're on that other thing. What is it called? Pictogram? Instagram. Or? Instagram. <laughs> Pictogram. Something like that. We're inventing something else. Okay, Stop you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, and of course, you can subscribe to our newsletter. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Remember to come back, same time, same place, next week. Until then, don't do drugs. Always do your best. Don't ever change, and always rock on. Take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>